about the American Lung Association. I'm Caroline Hutchinson, the Executive Director for the Greater Philadelphia Area. So our vision is a world free from lung disease and our mission is to save lives by improving lung health and preventing lung disease. We have four strategic imperatives, defeat lung cancer, champion clean air for all, create a tobacco free future and improve the quality of life for those with lung disease and their families. And we do accomplish this through education, advocacy and research. Uh, the need is more is more urgent than ever. Um, a couple of statistics, lung cancer is the number one cancer killer of both men and women. More than four in 10 people live where pollution levels are dangerous. COPD is the third leading cause of disease related deaths. And of course, the, the COVID-19 pandemics um, such as COVID-19 threaten world health. Um, our impact is done from, we funded 175 million in lung health research, more than 50 years of advocating for everyone's right to breathe clean air and serving 36.6 million Americans who suffer with lung disease. Um, here and now we're combating the pandemic through our uh, COVID-19 action plan. Um, we have weekly webinars. This is, um, we fund research. So if you go to lung.org forward slash COVID-19, you can learn more about what the American Lung Association is doing around COVID-19. And we launched our $25 million action initiative um, where we're gonna fund in three years, $25 million worth of research around COVID-19 and other pandemics. Um, other, other research that we're doing, um, we have our first ever millennial lung health study um, we also have um, 8.7 million in research grants for 2019 to 2020. Um, and that's done through our Airways Clinical Research Centers. Um, and it's also our 20th year of the Airway Clinical Research Centers. The local research center um, is Temple Lung Health. The American Lung Association's uh, Airways Clinical Research Centers um, network is um, where they do a bunch of clinical trials um, and that directly impact COPD and asthma. We have 15 clinical research centers throughout the country and uh, the data coordinating center managed by a team at John Hopkins University um, or hospital. The signature reports that we send out every year, the state of the year comes out in April, state of tobacco control comes out in January and state of lung cancer in November. We have signature programs, better breathers clubs, which are support groups for um, people living with COPD and other lung diseases. We have freedom from smoking, which is our smoking cessation program. Asthma basis is education for the asthma patient. Um, our lung force initiative, which is surrounded by lung cancer um, and our lung health line are just to name a few. And the way we move our mission forward is, is through special events and fundraising and cause marketing and sponsorships, direct mail, individual giving. And then we have a four star charity um, through Charity Navigator, which is super exciting. Um, and the American Lung Association signature of the Lung Force Walk, Lung Force Expo and Fight to Fear Climb. Um, we had a virtual. So this Saturday, June 20th, we have our Lung Force first, Lung Force virtual walk in Philadelphia. Um, and Lung Health Services is having a um, team. So if you want to join their team or make a donation, you could go to action.lung.org forward slash go to forward slash LHS20. And we have a Breathe Deeper Challenge happening. If you go to www.breathedeeperchallenge.org and blow up a balloon and measure it by centimeters, either make the donation or challenge three friends to do the same. Um, it's a really fun challenge happening right now that supports our lung force walk. And turquoise takeover is happening this week. We illuminated Boathouse Row, um, then Franklin Bridge, and the Commerce and Commerce Square in Philadelphia. Um, our 2020 fight for air climb is happening on September 12th. It was initially March 28th, but we moved it due to COVID-19. It's a 50 floor stair climb up three Logan Square, and you can learn more about that at fightforairclimb.org forward slash Philadelphia. And then our 43rd annual Radnor run, it's a five mile run um, and a one mile fun run. And it's happening Sunday, October 25th at 8.30 at the Radnor Township building. If you wanna learn more, it's www.lung.org forward slash Radnor run. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nina, who's gonna talk more on lung cancer during COVID-19. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Can you hear me okay? Yes. 
All right, perfect. Thank you for everybody that actually found the time to come in and join us during this uh, webinar. We just wanted to go over really the status of what lung cancer is about during this actual pandemic. And I'm going to go over an overview of lung cancer, COVID-19, and how the two are actually able to coexist despite the challenges that we are facing today. So let's start with the overview of lung cancer. Lung cancer, despite the pandemic happening right now, still and remains the number one killer in men and women worldwide. There is a campaign that was initiated and we have been trying to inform and educate that we can be saved by the scan when it comes to lung cancer. If you screen early, I'm happy to report that we've diagnosed a good 150 to 174 lung cancer at Lung Health uh, Services and we were able to do that thanks to early screening. When you get the early screening done, you end up getting the lung nodules at an early stage and you end up having a resection, which means a cure. Um, more importantly, this year at the ASCO 20, which is the Cancer Society, the American Cancer Society, which was virtual for the first time ever, they introduced immunotherapy and targeted therapies, precision therapies that are able to treat lung cancer specifically without necessarily having to use the chemotherapy. And that's huge news for most of lung cancer that actually uh, qualify, specifically the adenocarcinomas. But above all, what's really important is that now we had guidelines for lung cancer, and now we have guidelines for lung cancer during the actual uh, pandemic. So what is the COVID-19? And I'm sure you've heard about this in the news and all the media day in and day out. But what is COVID-19? We all know that it actually spread. It's a virus that spreads through respiratory tract by droplets and direct contact. So it's important for lung cancer patients and anybody that is needing to be tested to keep in mind that the mask does actually protect. The uh, aerosols live in the air approximately one hour. And remember that they live five hours on steel and approximately close to seven hours on plastic. So when you go and touch surfaces that are made out of these uh, products, keep in mind that you ought to really know what you're touching. Um, keep in mind also public bathrooms and everything else. Just take your precautions, go on the CDC guidelines and read them even though they are lengthy and um, uh, live prudently. So the um, median incubation period generally is three to five days. And we know that the patient is out of the woods by day 14, and that's why they say stay in for 14 days. 95% experience some type of symptoms, but for the lung cancer population and lung uh, thor and the thoracic disease population, they really need to be in tune with their bodies to know and understand what it is that's happening. Don't dismiss a shortness of breath. Don't dismiss a fever. If you feel that something is off, listen to yourself. You're living in that body 24-7 and reach out to your physicians and healthcare team and tell them, hey, listen, I know I have COPD. I am not feeling right. It's not a normal COPD exacerbation. Something ought to be done about it. Infectiousness begins approximately two days before the symptoms onset. So keep that in mind if you go outside. Um, next slide. Sorry. So what does COVID looks like on CAT scans? Generally, they say, okay, get a chest x-ray and go ahead with that. All segments can be involved and sometimes you might not see it on the chest x-ray. So once you talk to your physician and your healthcare team, make sure that you ask the specific questions after presenting your symptoms to see if a CAT scan is appropriate for you. 79% of the patients that have COVID-19 have bilateral lung involvement. So it's not like you're going to have a pneumonia only on one side. It tends to involve both. So when you look at this, and if some of my patients are online, they'll understand what they're looking at. I always give the example of a slicer uh, when you go buy cold cuts, whether it's turkey or uh, um, uh, uh, what is it, roast beef, and you end up setting exactly the slices of how thick the meat is going to be. Well, that's what the scanner does for us whenever we lay inside the scanner. So the images that you're looking at are in fact looking at your lungs from feet down. So on the left side of the screen is the right lung, which is the black area. And on the right side of the screen is the left lung. And you can see at the top picture that there is more blackness than whiteness. And the ground glass opacities is actually in reference to the ground glass structure that you have on the shower doors. And that's the haziness that's white that you see inside the black areas of the lungs. 
at the beginning, you can just have a little bit of ground glass here and there. And patients can actually be asymptomatic. We have patients that had lung carcinomas and lung cancers screening that have had no symptoms. And suddenly we find them with having ground glass opacities and they turn out to be COVID-19 positive. But the worst case scenario, and that's why people are really not doing well, is the bottom one on the right, which shows you that there is diffuse whiteness and hardly any black area. And that's because the oxygen cannot diffuse because of the debris and the amount of fibrosis or inflammation they end up having in the lungs. The most common pattern by far is the GGOs, which stand for ground glass opacities. All right, next slide. So thinking about this, you, in general, you say, okay, you go to the doctor, they say the chest x-ray is okay, or they say the CAT has ground glass opacities. But for lung cancer patients, it is absolutely crucial and important to understand that these are very challenging diagnoses to make based on CAT scan alone. It needs to be really a multidisciplinary approach. You need not only to talk to your physician, but your physician more than likely, whether it's an oncologist or pulmonologist or an infectious disease doc, they're gonna talk to everybody else and consult among one another. And that's the biggest challenge that we have nowadays is the fact that you need to get all the docs and their one single umbrella to be able to talk and, and, and discuss really the case. For lung cancer patient, that is a must and it's crucial because it can be another viral pneumonia. It can be another bacterial pneumonia that present just exactly that way that tends to hit specifically immunosuppressed patients. So COVID-19 is at the top right now, but in the lung cancer population, it might not be. It might be something that we deal with every day. We just need to keep that in mind. It can also be secondary to lung cancer, uh, to uh, radiation, pneumonitis, or as I said earlier, immunotherapies and targeted therapies can cause an inflammatory reaction similar to what the virus causes into our lungs and can give us the ground glass opacities and the whiteout. So it's a diagnostic challenge that you should not be scared of discussing with your physicians whenever you meet with them. Next slide. So this is the actual clinical course of the major symptoms and the duration of the viral shedding from the illness onset all the way until the patients are hospitalized with COVID-19. And the survivors, most of the time, by day 14, this starts getting better. However, those who will not survive by day 14 start developing an other organ damage, whether it's an acute renal failure or secondary infection, and you could see that within two weeks. So that's why the two weeks cut off from people that are completely asymptomatic to people that have symptoms are hospitalized is really a general good idea in knowing whether they're going to get off and be okay or whether they're going to worsen. Next slide. This is really, without getting into the technicality of it, it's important to keep in mind that people need to be screened. So whenever you end up going into the outpatient centers and whenever you end up needing to have a outpatient surgery or procedure, it is important to end up having a screening for COVID-19. Some patients who did not have any symptoms, who did not have any finding on CAT scan, whenever they ended up going and doing a lobectomy and a resection for their lung cancer, end up showing that they did have COVID-19 and therefore pretty much everybody was exposed in that OR and the patient did okay and did well. Other people who end up not doing so well, when you looked at their bi uh, biopsies and their pathology, you could see that they completely fibrosed and clocked up those balloons at the end of the windpipes that allow the diffusion of oxygen. Next slide. So the message that I wanted to really communicate here is that we have a massive distraction effect from the pandemic. Lung cancer is still number one in killing people, in killing men and women, and we must get back on track. COVID-19, like, and I'm pretty sure everybody is pretty much tired at this point of hearing about it. It is a deadly disease and it is here to stay for a long period of time until we end up finding a vaccine. But there is definitely a specific and pretty significant backlog in all the cancer diagnoses, Mem whether it's mammography, whether it's um, CAT scans for screening. So avoid, if possible, delaying any curative interventions. If you need to get chemotherapy, if you need to get radiation, discuss it with your healthcare team and figure out if you actually are able in a safe manner to undergo your chemotherapy. And more importantly, for the curative standpoint, surgical resection. Um, I mean, delaying your chemo or withholding because you just don't want to go outside can have a definite uh, potential uh, negative impact on your survivalship when it comes to lung cancer, specifically in the advanced stages. Next slide. 
Continuum of care, as I stated, uh, is a must, but it has to be done while protecting the patients from the infection. So wherever you are, you have and you ought to actually ask the uh, healthcare team and the offices and the outpatient cancer centers whether or not there are procedures in place. And if you do not understand something, you should ask to understand better what are the proceedings. Some people are really scared, and I think the emotional support is starting to build up because of the um, policies in not bringing the family members inside the area of care. And I think I, I'll give you the example of one of my patients who has not tell, told anyone that she actually delayed care and chose not to proceed with her immunotherapy infusion. It's a half hour infusion and she skipped it for three months. Now we're restaging and of course the cancers have progressed. Don't make a unilateral decision. You have to discuss it with your physician. They will modify the regimen scheduled. They will actually limit the number of clinical visits and they might run the medication over a shorter period of time. So you're not out there for a longer period of time. And some of them have screening protocols automatically before they bring you in. So continuum of care is a must. We have to actually not lose any more that we've lost already in, in combating uh, the uh, lung cancer. Next stage, next um, slide, sorry. All right, so now let's discuss different questions that some of my patients have asked me. Go ahead, we're going to do a Q&A. Carolyn? Sure. Is it safe to return to routine activities? Short answer is no. <laughs> when I mean by routine activities, routine activities like going and hanging out with friends, going into the stores like we usually do it in the past, going to the, what, what, what opened just recently? It was the home... Um, I forgot the name of it. Home goods. Home goods. Home goods. Did you see what happened at Home Goods? There is a line all the way to the parking lot, at least in the Doylestown area. So now, be smart about it, and don't go back to the routine. There is a new normal. Respect the CDC guidelines. Thank you. Are lung cancer patients at higher risk of developing complications from COVID nineteen? So they have done a study now, and thank God we have the results of the registry that was presented at the ASCO 20, which is the cancer conference that I spoke about earlier, and they tracked the outcome of lung cancer um, that were infected with COVID-19. And they've noted that patients that have non-small cell carcinoma stage 4 were definitely at a higher risk of com a complication. Up to 33% of them have ended up dying from complication of COVID-19. More importantly, smokers and and patients that have cancer that are smoking also appears to have had a higher risk of severe complication from COVID-19. And the cancer that is associated with smoking mainly is small cell carcinoma. They are already at a higher risk of having complications because of the immunosuppressive therapy. But on top of it, if they are continuously smoking, then definitely they will have more complications and their survival is definitely lower. Are lung, oh, are lung cancer patients more susceptible to infection by the new SARS COVID 2 coronavirus or developing serious disease as a result? Okay, so it's important to distinguish between having a higher risk of complication once they acquire the virus and being more susceptible in attracting or contracting the virus. Two different things. Patients with lung cancer are among the highest risk category, meaning that if they get it, they do worst. However, they do not appear to be more susceptible to acquiring the novel virus. So if you are safe, if you are taking your precautions, chances are you're not gonna get it. However, if you end up getting it, your symptoms and the complications are more severe than the general population. The reason for that, it's because the immune system is significantly suppressed, and more importantly, the immunotherapy, which are checkpoint blockade, with checkpoint blockade, which means your immune system is not as well um, empowered to battle infections, end up having more complication from COVID-19 because of the inflammatory response that they end up having. Thank you. I think I'm having a hard time. Hold on. Oh, here's another one. Even amid this pandemic, cancer hasn't stopped. Did COVID-19 alter how we provide care for people with cancer? The diagnosis continue, like I said. However, because there are two things. Patients that should have been diagnosed have not been diagnosed because there was a delay. 
but there has been people that have underwent CAT scans images to verify whether they had COVID-19 that turn out to have been diagnosed with lung cancer that otherwise wouldn't have been able to be diagnosed with lung cancer if it wasn't for the COVID-19. I hope you followed me. So the care delay, <laughs> sorry, can happen because the resources are being allocated somewhere else. So the outpatient centers were closed, CAT scans were not as easily made. You used to be able to just walk in to get a chest X-ray, that's no more. So there is definitely, and we see a tremendous reduction in the early screening with low dose CTs. But we are diagnosing more than we would have in certain population that are younger that wouldn't have went to get the CAT scan done if it wasn't for the COVID-19. So overall, Use the telemedicine, try to get your screening if possible, definitely have a multidisciplinary uh, conversation with your physician and your healthcare team. And the biggest concerns in going to the centers or going getting screened are legit and both the patients as well as their caregiver have a full healthcare, public healthcare measures that are actually on the CDC website and I put it on there. And don't be scared to reach out and ask questions. And as most of you that are actually, that know me that are on, you can reach out and ask me a question and I'll be able to help in any way, shape or form I can. That's all, any other questions? Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you so much. So now we're gonna open up to um, our our attendees. So you just have to type in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your screen. If you can send your message either to everybody so we can see it or uh, directly to American Lung Association so we can answer it. Katie, have there been any questions yet? Not so far. Uh, we haven't seen any questions come through, but let's give everyone a moment to, you know, process all the incredible information Dr. Nina just shared with us um, and we'll see if anything comes through. I'll let you know. So I have one that showed up right here from uh, that says, are there any stats about cancer patients contracting COVID-19 while in the hospital? And believe it or not, the CDC have been trying to track all these data. Uh, no studies have been done, but the, what they've noted is the older they are, Originally, whenever there wasn't really a mass testing, there has been a significant amount of um, cross-contamination, I should say, in the elderly population. And that's similarly to what has happened in the nursing home problem. And uh, I mean, not that the nursing homes are hospitals, but the delay in, rec in recognizing that there, were that there was asymptomatic spread at the beginning of the pandemic has caused definitely a cross-contamination. Now, whether the hospitals have made that available or whether the CDC has actually published any of that, they haven't published anything as of yet. But at the beginning, yes, now I don't think that there is because they definitely have different COVID units and the nursing staff that is in charge of COVID tends to not uh, be involved with others. And uh, similarly for the groups and the consultants. Katie, any other questions? I haven't gotten any others. All right, we'll give it a couple more minutes. If you have any comments, if you liked it, we, we'd love to see those comments too. Dr. Nina did amazing, keeping it Thank you. really good, keeping it under a half hour. Lots of I tried. <laughs> yeah. I tried not to speak too fast. <laughs> Well, I don't see anything else, Caroline. Oh, great, we're getting some really positive uh, messages, which which makes me happy, and I'm sure it makes Dr. Nina happy. So um, we're so grateful for your time and expertise, Dr. Nina, and Thank you. your, your dedication. Your you know being on the Philadelphia Leadership Board and supporting Lung Force, um, and uh, just being a part of the organization. It's so great to have you, and um, we hope you have a great night. Oh, I do have one more question. Um, one of our attendees said uh, to Dr. Nina, I haven't been diagnosed with lung cancer, but I have a cough. Should I be concerned? Uh, there is multiple questions that need to be answered. So is there a smoking history? And um, definitely, what I, first of all, I would recommend to definitely reach out to your physician and be able to ask more questions. So it's really just solving a puzzle when you have a symptom. The way I always approach any symptom is to try to dig in further because it's just, just a cough. Cough can be ultimately the end 
road, if you want, of something bigger, whether it's post nasal drip, whether it's reflux, whether it's something going on with the lungs. So the investigator or the physician that will end up evaluating you will ask you multiple questions. If the cough is persistent, definitely. If you have a cough that is not a regular cough, like people tend to uh, call it, you ought to at least see a physician and figure out exactly is there something organic or not. And I would rather be safe than sorry. So definitely have it checked out. Great. Thank you, Dr. Nina. You're that's, welcome. that's the end of questions. All right. Sounds good. Great. Thanks. Thank everybody. you so much for having me. We'll do it again soon. Thank you. All right. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.